I like to call the forgotten holiday. I'm not bitter. I get it. I get it. But I just want to remind you, you know, Mother's Day, they set up tents in parking lots. You know, HEB has a whole section for, you know, for Mother's Day. Uh, the kids are in school making arts and crafts. And then Father's Day is like, oh, I need to get a card from somewhere. I get it. I get it. At the Avenue, we focus on fathers because we believe <clears throat> that the church needs to reach out to men. I think for a lot of years, the church had kind of lost that focus. And when I started uh, pastoring this church, the church was really geared toward women and children. I mean, for men to come to church, you came because you love Jesus, but that was about all. <clears throat> and the only way you served is really walking up and down and, and taking the offering. You just, church was not for you. And, and honestly, I mean, nothing was set up for us. Fresh flowers every week, I mean, that's not for us. They had something called mauve carpet. <laughs> mauve is not a color. That's pink. You just call it what it is. It's pink. And so a lot of things when I came into the church as a pastor weren't geared around men at all. And so one of the things we wanted to do at the Avenue was we wanted to reach men in particular. We wanted to make it a, a type of uh, environment that they were comfortable in. And that's why, you know, maybe a little darker than some of you like, a little louder than some of you like, uh, secular music in the comments, all of those kind of things, dressing down. Uh, all of those things were things that we thought would help us reach the one because one of our verses, that's a key verse for us, we've been doing it all this summer. It's called The 99 is a Series. And it comes from a passage in Luke 15. It says, Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the 99 in open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? Well, it seemed like a lot of churches weren't concerned with the lost sheep. Everything was gathering together, huddling together, serving together in the small room. It was all about us, and we did our little thing, and, and we weren't really concerned about that one. And so what we're going to do as a church is we're going to do everything we can to find the one and bring them in. But now, we've got to remember, once we bring them in, we have to bring them to an environment that they want to be in. Now, one of the key things in that environment is it needs to be a safe place, it needs to be a clean place. It needs to have all of these qualities. And when I first started in this church, it was kind of a, an eye-opener. When I came to the church, I was excited about being a pastor. I was very young. Uh, and we were walking around the church. And as we're walking around the church, I have this team of people who've called me to be the pastor. And there's about a 17, 18-year-old teenager. She was part of that team. They're walking me around, showing me you know, all the things in the church. We come up to the nursery and, uh, yeah, and I want to be careful with this because a lot of you here were here back then. And this isn't a critique on you because, I mean, this is kind of what happens when you're family. In my house, when we have a guest coming, uh, it gets nuts. I mean, we've got to clean things. I don't know why we have to clean some of the things we clean. I don't know why guests are coming in, checking out our shower and looking under our bed. But apparently you guys do. And so you've got to clean everything. But when family's coming over, we don't even have to do the dishes. You know, when family's coming over, we don't have to vacuum. We don't have to do everything to get ready for family. And church, somehow, it gets into the fact that it's family, and so they don't see things that visitors see. Or when you get that one to come into the community, they see things that you've forgotten. And that's what had happened in this nursery. As I walked into this nursery for the first time, I thought, oh, you've got to be kidding me. My first thought is my wife is not going to let our baby stay here. Now, we had three kids under five years old, and we increased the children's ministry by 10% just by joining. At, you know, there wasn't a lot of them. But the nursery area, it had this brown shag carpet, and I think it was brown for a reason. I think it kind of blended. It smelled like it did. And so you would look at, I looked in there, and I saw that. And then in the corner of one of the rooms, somebody had taken old pieces of paneling, brown paneling, and they built a closet into the room just using paneling and nailing it to a two-by-four. It was unbelievable. In the middle of the room, against the back wall, was one of those little vanities you buy at Walmart or somewhere for like $49. You know, has a little sink and a little counter. They put that in the middle of the room against the wall. 
but there was no pipes there. And so they ran the pipes down the wall into a bathroom that was on the other side of the nursery in the hallway. And so you had a sewer pipe and a water pipe running down, visibly open. Now, some of you mothers are like, you've got to be kidding me. I'm not kidding you. So that was our nursery. And then even the horse barn, where we put the babies, there was this four uh, cribs, two on top, two on bottom, against the wall that opened like this. I'm not joking. They were cages. We, and I get it. I've seen some of your kids. They need to be in a cage. But I didn't think that was good for visitors to see us putting your kids in a cage. Yeah, bring me number one. Here we go. Put them in a the cage. There we go. Shut that door. And I just remember thinking, God, i got to think of something positive to say because I'm overwhelmed. I'm looking at this going, oh, you're kidding me. And so all of a sudden on the wall, I noticed there's this mural that's painted, and it's Jesus on a hillside with kids around them. It's about two-thirds finished. And so I come in, oh, that's really beautiful. When is that going to be finished? The 17, 18-year-old looks at me and goes, I don't know. It looked like that when I was in the nursery. (laughs) Houston, we have a problem. This is a poor church, and one of the first things I said is we have to completely remodel the nursery. They didn't see a problem with the nursery because at that point, they weren't used to trying to reach the one. They were a family. They came together, and, and that's, that's great. The 99, when they do church right, when they come together, they're to be a family, a happy family that serves each other and loves each other. And so when you all come together as a family, that's wonderful. God is a father. We get that. Now, when we say God's a father for some of you in the room, that's not a positive thing. But we do have a God as a father, and he's a good father. And he loves us, and he gives us gifts, and he gives us gifts to use to strengthen each other. And we're supposed to be a family, but we're always supposed to be looking out for that one. Now, why did Jesus, why was he able to leave the 99? He was able to leave the 99 because he expected them to be able to feed themselves. Now, for the church, when you come together, you don't need me to feed you. You don't need me to pour into you. I've heard people say before, I left the church, they just weren't feeding me. And I don't ever tell me that. Man, that's one of my hot buttons. I will go off on you. Because if you're a follower, nobody needs to feed you. You don't need a sermon or a video or a workbook. You need the Holy Bible and the Holy Spirit. That's all you need to grow. That is all you need. And so if you're a follower, you're to open that word. We talked about that a few weeks ago. You can get online and just read the Bible. Read a scripture, pick a scripture, make your observations, apply it to your life, and and, and grow. You're supposed to be able to feed yourself. You're supposed to be able to protect yourself. You're supposed to be able to be there for one another. And we talked about last week, there's some things you just got to stop doing because we're trying to encourage people to come. Remember, we're trying to build a community that's so attractive that when people on the outside look at us, they they want what we have. They may look at us and go, man, I can't buy into that somebody coming back from the dead. But they're good people, and they love each other, and they love their community. They, they, are, they are good people. We want to be a part of that. The reason we can be that, and the reason we can be that community, is we have a Father who's given every one of us a gift. Now, if you're in the room today, and you've said, I believe in Jesus Christ, he's forgiven my sins, and I am following him. He is my Lord. If that is you today, God gave you a gift at that moment. You all received a gift. Now, some of you are like, man, God must have missed me. I ain't got no gifts. But you do. You have a very powerful gift in your life. Now, today, if you're one of the ones and you're just here and you're trying to get questions answered, that's fine. This is not for you. But if you're a follower, you received a gift on the day you accepted Jesus, and that gift is the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, some of you are afraid when I say Holy Spirit. You're like, "Uh uh-oh, he's going to get all crazy-matic on us. Listen, we're not afraid of the Spirit here. We believe that we do everything in the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is power. God said, Jesus said he was going to send us a helper, and that helper comes alongside of us, and he equips us, and he gives us a gift. And the most important gift that we receive from our Father is the Holy Spirit of God. That's the gift. The Holy Spirit of God is the gift that he has given each and every one of you. Now, we get caught up a lot of times on spiritual gifts, and that's why I'm not going through them and listing them. Because a lot of people get caught up on, well, do I have this gift, this gift? What's my gift? You take spiritual inventories. You're looking for your gift. Listen, the gift is the Holy Spirit. And he'll equip you to do whatever he calls you to do. But you receive a gift for one reason. That's to strengthen the faith of someone else. You don't get a gift for you. You're not getting a gift to build you up. You're not getting a gift to grow your faith. You receive a gift so you can build somebody else's faith. That's what it's for. 
This passage says it in Romans. This is Paul writing to the church in Rome. He says, I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. God has given you this gift so when we come together, we can serve each other in such a way that we strengthen each other's faith. You know, there's some people in this room going through a hard time. There's some people in this room that are struggling. There's some people in this room that need somebody to come alongside them in faith and walk with them. There are people in this room that need you because you've already been through it. They need you because you've already been through a divorce. They need you because you've already been through the loss of a child. They need you because you've already been laid off from your job. And our gift is to find people around us and to strengthen them. It's to teach our children faith and get a faith that is so deep that they have an anchor in their life. So when the world starts pulling them away from us, that anchor stays put. That's why you use your gift. So that's what Paul's saying. He says, I can't wait to use my gift. Listen, God has gifted me with the Holy Spirit, and he has allowed me to do something that I love doing week in and week out, and that's speaking a word from God. I love speaking a word from God. Do I get anything out of it? I do. I get blessed by it. I love doing it. But if it's not for you, if it ever becomes about me, it ceases to be of God. You see, a lot of times we're afraid to ask God what he wants us to do. Some of you think that we have a Father in Heaven that is down there waiting for you to say yes, and then He's going to give you the worst job you can imagine. I mean, you think it. I've had people tell me before, man, you know, if I give my life to God, I'm going to have to give up beer. I, I can never drink again, so I'm not going to give my life to God. I've actually heard that. I've heard people say, if I give my life to God, He's going to send me to Africa. Now, I don't know why Africa is so bad, but apparently... I mean, that's the worst thing they can think of. They're like, man, I, you know, I'm going to have to give up everything and go to Africa. We think that we have this God in heaven that is looking at us, and as minute we say yes to him, he's going to do to us the worst possible thing he can do. That's not our God. Our God is going to gift you in an area that makes your heart beat faster. Our God is going to gift you in an area that when you use that gift, yes, you're strengthening others, but, man, you're strengthened through it too. Now, the great thing is, whatever he calls us to do, he'll equip us. Tomorrow, if God said, you're going to work in the nursery from now on talking to me, I would cry like a baby. I'd be in there with them, just crying. Because I don't feel like I'd be gifted. But if God wanted me there, he'd equip me there. And I would enjoy it. And that's the crazy thing about it. God has given us all different tasks and different abilities. And the Bible tells us in this passage that we're going to look at today in 1 Peter 4. It says, each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others. Every one of you received a gift, and that gift is something that's going to be able to serve others. And he says, you administer grace. Listen to this. When you receive grace, you give grace. When you see grace in your life, you're able to share grace with others. And so when you realize what a sinner you are, when you realize how you fail, when you realize God has been there for you, you and then turn, take that gift, and you share that grace with others. Now, there's a parable in the Bible talking about a master who gave talents to three different servants. It says he gave five to one, two to another, one to the third. The five, the guy that had five went out and invested and then worked it and brought back ten. The guy that had two went out and invested, came back with two. The guy that only had one talent took that one talent he had, went out in the backyard and buried it in a hole. When the master came back, he asked for an accounting of the talents, and he was very excited about the two that had gone and used their talent, but he was very upset with the one that hid their talent in a hole. Folks, our God's going to be very upset with many of us in the room because he gave us a valuable gift, and we're not using it for the kingdom of God. God has called you. Everyone in this room that loves Jesus, that has been called by him, is to give a gift and use that gift to serve others. And it's amazing what he does. Do you know there are people that are sitting in the nursery this week? They're sitting in this beautiful nursery. Once again, we put all our money in our children's area we possibly can. We spend hundreds of thousands of dollars over in Ennis in a building we don't own because our children are that important. We spent millions of dollars here, so we will never have to tell a family again that the nurseries are closed because we're out of room. God has enabled us to do those things for our children. There are people in there. And they get on the floor with these snotty-nosed, poopy diaper kids. And they smile. And they love it. And they can't wait to come back the next week. I don't get it. I do not understand them at all. I mean, I can handle my own grandkids. But, you know, if I can pass off a poopy diaper to Nana, I'm passing it on. But they just stay in there. 
because God has gifted them. We had a group of people that took off with third, fourth, and fifth graders for a week. These are grown adults that slept on a mattress about this thick. And they're with kids that don't shower. (laughs) And I showed up at camp, and they were smiling and happy to be there. And I'm thinking, you're kidding. You just defined hell. And you're loving this, and and that's incredible. There are people that spend time with junior high students on purpose. And they don't get paid because God has gifted them. And he's going to gift you in an area that does make your heart beat faster. Listen, at the Avenue, we don't put people in spots. We don't look for warm bodies. We don't get you there by guilting you there. We want you to serve somewhere that lights you up and makes you use the gift of God to build others up. And when it builds others up, It blesses you. Each gift you've been given, every one of you. Please don't sit there and say you haven't received a gift because you're calling the Father a liar. You've received a gift. You just haven't found it yet. You haven't used it yet, and I need you to use it. He goes on. He says there's gifts of speaking. There's gifts of words. Some of you have the gift of words. Now, I'm talking about words from God, not your own. Some of you, that's confusing. But... uh, Many of you have gift of words. You know this. People have told you what a great teacher you are, or you make things sound so simple, or you can explain things. One of the biggest compliments I get is, man, you make it where anybody can understand. You must not be very smart. I'm like, I'm not. That's why it works. (laughs) You have a gift, and you need to be using that gift. Some of you have the gift of deeds. I mean, you just do things that need to be done. You can fix things. You're out there doing whatever it takes, and it's a huge spiritual gift to walk around this campus and pick up trash. That's a gift. That's a gift that blesses the body. And we may not see it, and you don't get to stand on the stage, and you don't have the light on you, but that gift is equal to everything we do on this stage, from the most talented musician to anybody who speaks. Some of you have a gift of deeds. You want to serve. You want to help. You want to do those things, and you need to use those. And we do everything for one reason, to bring God glory. Remember, we're building a community that when people see it, they're attracted to it. We do it for God's glory. I want to tell you something every week that happens behind this curtain. Now, no, for the most important thing, I'm always watching behind this curtain. I watch y'all all all the time. Some of you are hilarious during the music. You really are. I just love to watch you. But there's a prayer that I've been praying before I speak for 28 years. Now, it's natural when you have a gift and when God's given you a gift. It's natural to come out here And I want you to like the preaching. I want you to stay awake. I want you to leave going, the preacher did a good job. That's natural for me. When my family is in the room, I want them to be proud that that I'm their family, that I did a good job, that people are listening. That's a natural thing for me. And so when I'm back there praying, my prayer is always the same prayer every week. God, I want to speak in a way that you can use it to make people take a step toward Jesus. God, I want to speak clearly. I want to speak simply. And I want to make a point today that everybody has a gift and we need to use it. God, I pray that when I go out there, that's what happens. But then there's another part of the prayer. God, if it brings you more glory... For me to walk out there and trip on one of these wires that they lay all over the place. God, if it gives you more glory for me to stand in front of this room and stand on the internet and everywhere else. And I can't remember a word. And I stutter and I stammer and I get sick and I run off in tears. If that brings you more glory, that's what I want to happen today. That's what it's about, God. It's your glory. It's not about me. It's not about whether they like what I say. It's not about my family being proud. It's about you receiving glory. And if you receive glory by me getting the message out, praise God. If you receive glory by me being a fool and making a fool of myself, praise God. Do you know the pressure that takes off? If I fall off this stage today, I'm okay. (laughs) It's on the internet forever. I mean, God gets glory for it, whatever. So today, I don't want you to be afraid to serve him because whether you fail or succeed, you're serving. You're doing it for his glory. You're doing it for him. And so I want to encourage you today to find your spiritual gift. Now, don't get caught up. There's in in Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, Ephesians 4, the spiritual gifts are listed. And that's great. You need to read those. You need to see if any of them fit into that. But remember, the the main gift is the Holy Spirit. He's going to equip you to do whatever he asks you to do. The way to find your spiritual gift, first of all, you need to talk to the Father. 
You just need to pray. You need to ask him. You need to talk with him. You need to have conversations. God, the preacher said I'm supposed to be serving. I don't feel like I have a gift, God. My heart doesn't beat faster about nothing. You need to check your heart, and God will do that when you speak to him. You need to open the word of God. Some of you are saying, God doesn't talk to me, but you never open the word of God. God speaks through his word. That's a letter to you. There's something in there. If you let the Holy Spirit speak, he's going to speak to you about your spiritual gift. And then third, ask people that know you. Talk to people around you. Talk to the people that you go to church with. Listen, you may have the best smile in the room, and they're going to look at you and go, man, you've got this great smile. You need to serve as a greeter on Sunday. You've got this great smile. They may say, you can't smile at all. You should be on the security team. <laughs> Whatever it is, let them speak into you. Somebody may say, man, whenever you talk about the Bible, it's just so clear. Well, you're supposed to be a life group leader. I mean, there's all kinds of things. Talk to people. And then here's the key. Serve. Trial by error. Get out there. Get started. Find a place, find a hole, find something that we need. And we're going to offer a ministry fair today. When you go out, there are places you can meet to get involved today because we believe in it. You need to serve. And so if you get out there and you're like, man, I want to drive a golf cart, and then you wreck the first day, that's not your gift. <laughs> Give up the golf cart. you got to do something else. you got to do something else. But there is something here. And now this is where the shearing comes in. Listen closely as your pastor. This church is not built for consumers. It's not built for people who say they follow God and don't serve. And that sounds ugly, and I don't want it to. I want, to, I want it to come from a pastor's heart. I want you to hear me clearly. Now, if you're seeking and you're, you're one, the one that we're looking for, man, I don't care how much you consume. You can consume all you want. I'll give you free coffee to keep you coming. I don't care. But if you say you're a believer and you're not serving somewhere in the walls of this church, you're disobedient. You're disobedient. Some of you are out there and you're going, oh, I don't have time to serve. My kids are so involved in sports. That's a problem. That's a problem. I don't have time to serve my work schedule. That's a problem. Because God has given everyone a gift to use to strengthen the body of Christ. That means we're all part of the body and all of us have a function. And some of you are sitting and consuming and then you're wondering why your life isn't going the way you want it to go. You're wondering why when I talk to God, he doesn't appear to listen. When I pray to him, I don't hear his voice. Because he's already told you some things that you're supposed to be doing. One of them serving. And so once you say no to him, he's not going to tell you something else. And I have people tell me, you know, uh, well, we're praying for God to bless us. I'm like, really? Are you reading your Bible? Are you praying? Are you serving? Then why are you asking God to bless you? You really asking him to bless your disobedience? God's not going to bless your disobedience. Good things may happen in your life, but God's not blessing disobedience. And so today, hear me, and I'm not trying to be ugly about it. I am for you. If you want to be a mature Christian, if you want to be a devoted follower, then you must serve somewhere in the walls of this church. So I want to encourage you to do that today. I want to encourage you to walk forward. I'm going to pray for you and with you. And once again, I'm not trying to offend you in this. I'm just speaking the Word of God. A lot of things in the Word of God I wish I could change. This ain't one of them. I'm glad. I know what it's like to be used by Him. I know what it feels like to be obedient to Him. I want that for you. Say yes. Say yes. Would you bow with me? Father God, I thank you that you're a good Father. And on this Father's Day, we all have things in our life and we all have wounds in our lives from fathers. But God, you don't wound us. You just want to bless us. I pray that we'll say yes to you, be obedient to you. And every person in this room that says they're a follower will call on you and say yes and serve some way this next week. Help them find a place to live in obedience to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This is a story that's recorded in the book of Acts. It's Jesus' last moments of ministry on the earth. The last thing he says is you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And then he begins to ascend toward heaven. 
And it says, while they are gazing at the sky, while they are watching him, an angel of the Lord appears and says, men of Galilee, why are you staring at the sky? The force of the moment is, man, he just told you you're going to have the power to be his witness. You're going to have the ability to be his witness. You're going to be potent as his witness. And he says, don't just stand at the stare at the sky. Don't sit in the worship service and wait for the encounter of Christ because he's coming back one day. And his return should propel us into action right now. And so today, don't just stare at the sky. Do something with what he's given you. You don't have to know your spiritual gift to remember that you have the gift of the Holy Spirit. and He's using you. He has made you powerful, potent, and able to do what he wants you to do in the lives of the people that he wants you to work in. And so today we have made an opportunity for you to get plugged into this church. This church is a safe place to practice being a witness. Nobody's judging you. I forget names all the time and I, th I think I've been forgiven for it. And ultimately we are gonna give you the grace to, to practice. And so plug in today. So on the porch, you're gonna have people uh, from each volunteer team. They're gonna get you plugged in wherever you wanna go. If you don't know where to go, I'll be out on the front porch. A few other staff members will be out there helping you figure out what's a good fit for you. But again, it's ultimately up to what are you passionate about? What are you gifted in? Don't go somewhere you're gonna hate. We don't want you to go there. Um, and so uh, we'll have a, a graphic on the screen. Production will be meeting at the sound booth with you. They'll get you plugged in if you wanna, if you love technology, media, anything like that, they'll plug you in right here. Family check-in uh, right across the, from the family check-in on the porch. We'll have family ministry team volunteers ready to, to get you plugged in there. Guest services will be out in front of the, um, to the left of the porch. And then a, the safety team will be out directly on the other side of the cafe. Um, if you have any desire to serve, if you have any, uh, any compulsion to serve today, don't, don't just stare at the sky. Do something with it. Um, I just want to wish you guys a happy Father's Day because that's about all we do for fathers. Um, happy Father's Day. Y'all have a great weekend.